We're going to start off with a video, and during the video, I'm going to ask you a question about the video. And a warning, if you're in a public space, I think you should either turn down the, vi the volume a bit because the people can be a little loud, or put on your headphones. So giving you a few seconds to do so. So again, don't, I wouldn't blast this audio because people might give you funny looks. All right, so what does a MI look like? What does a heart attack look like? Who gives the most realistic performance of a heart attack? So most of you said that the second man gave the most realistic performance. Now let's find out what the correct answer is. Who gives the most realistic performance of a heart attack? Did you choose the man on the bench? Have another look. If you or someone else experience chest discomfort, nausea, sweating, or shortness of breath, call 111 immediately. Yeah, no a heart call. attack is not always as dramatic as you think. Okay, so don't call 111 because again, this is from New Zealand. So again, they have 111 instead of 911. But what you saw is that that man on the bench, as someone saw here, it's like not that dramatic. He had, what you saw is that he's clutching himself, he's clutching his side, he's clutching his arm. Yeah, that's why there was no correct answer because it was kind of, yes, it was one of those like, have you seen the, that in, that um, that video and you probably saw it in psychology where people are playing basketball and they tell you to measure the amount of times they pass the ball and then someone in a mascot, mascot costume does like a cartwheel in the middle of that. Yeah, it was a little tricky, but the main point is that heart attacks are, they are not always that dramatic where people are sobbing for breath or clutching their chest and like doing a whole over dramatic things. Yeah, so then what is are the leading causes of death in the United States? So I did ask you that last lecture. So heart disease is the number one cause and they actually did release the 2020. Again, what happened during 2020? Heart disease, unfortunately, is still number one. Cancer is number two. And then guess who slid in? Yeah, so COVID-19 is number three. And then accidents, so these are unintentional injuries. And then what we have here, stroke and diabetes. So diabetes got pushed down to number eight, still a lot of people. And there's always people like, okay, did they die from COVID-19? Like what is the cause of death? So when you're talking about cause of death, we're talking about things that initiated everything that happened that led to that person's death. Like for a car accident, people, yes, it's listed as an accident, but what do they, what's the actual mechanism? Typically organ damage or they bleed out. Same with cancer, like cancer is a growth, but the infection isn't considered the cause of death, even though it's the most common residual mechanism that results from cancer leading to that person's death. We still call, call that in first part that initiated, like this person was otherwise healthy. Then once they developed this, that set off the cascade of events that led to their death. Same with diabetes. So it's not just like the diabetes mellitus itself, but everything that happens as a consequence of the diabetes. So heart disease include everything that involves the heart and some sort of disease that leads to all the health effects that leads to somebody's death. Somebody's death. So this is why it's even with COVID-19, heart disease is still the number one, at least in 2020, leading cause of death. And again, 2021, they're probably still, I should see if it came out yet, but I don't think it's come out quite yet. Yeah. Oh, I haven't seen that ad. Yeah. Okay. So myocardial infarction symptoms. That's why I bring up that video because again, this is why it's like due to recognize in other people but hopefully i mean i mean we might have a region of ages watching right now hopefully you're not in that eight risk high risk um, age range for myocardial infarction but what are the classic symptoms like chest pain and again it's not always going to be like super obvious if you're seeing someone with a myocardial infarction but they often say it's like a crushing chest pain or they draw say it's like an elephant sitting on your chest even though there's no nothing, no weight actually being on the chest, so crushing chest pain, dizziness, nausea, or vomiting. So it's just not just about chest pain, but maybe they're feel, they're kind of feeling off because of all of these symptoms here. Jaw, neck, and back pain. So you're just like, okay, we were saying, wait, my heart's here, but why is my jaw? Why is my neck? Why am I back? I mean, back pain. If you're over 30, you probably are familiar with that. 
But I mean, it's just like, it's having, these are things that can happen along with this myocardial infarction. Pain in arm and shoulder. So if you notice in the previous video, the guy was kind of like holding his arm and they say like it might be tingling, it might be numbness, it might be a searing pain on the left side of the, heart of the body is being affected. And then shortness of breath is also common. So this, even though they're the people who are acting, they were really gasping. It's not necessarily always like that, but they might say like, I have trouble breathing. I can have this crushing chest pain. I can't feel my arm. So they, that's our, those are classic myocardial infarction symptoms. And time is of the essence and why, again, it goes back to our previous lecture about coronary arteries is that this is what's happening. The heart is being robbed of uh, adequate blood supply and then during ischemia so the heart tissue is dying so this is why to save as much heart tissue as possible you want to recognize and intervene as soon as possible yeah and this is arm shoulder pain limited to the left side so that's a very interesting thing like people there are people who have a rare condition called citizen versus where sometimes their organs are actually pointed mirror image the opposite way around so what they find out is that people who actually have their heart pointing to the right they have the when they have a heart attack they have the right arm affected so it's very interesting how yeah this but yeah so the left side most people's hearts are pointing down into the left so this is why typically you see that left arm if they have numbness in both that's kind of weird and maybe it's not a myocardial infarction but you might still want to do an EKG anyway but I put the asterisk near here because why this is all related to a phenomenon we call referred pain so referred pain, we did touch upon, upon this briefly last semester. So here we have referred pain and the other organs. I don't expect you to memorize this chart right here, but what it's showing you is that it's very interesting. Like compared to something that's like poking you or something that if you cut yourself, you know exactly where that cut or wound or injury is on your skin. But your internal organs, they are kind of funny. It's also related to that if you remember that homunculus, that weird distorted human and based on like how much of your cerebral cortex is devoted to that part of the body. So your internal organs don't map neatly to that, that sensory cortex. Now what we have with the heart. So the heart, again, where is your heart? Central and pointing down and towards the left, right? So again, <laughs> left, correct? So the heart is right here. But is your heart in your arm? Is your heart in your jaw? Is it in your neck? Is it in your back? Well, I mean, maybe in the thorax, but it's not over here, but why is it affecting that? So that is an interesting phenomenon. Sometimes when our internal organs experience pain, the pain spreads to parts that are far away from that original site. So that is what we call referred pain. And the heart, when it encounters injury and myocardial infarctions, that is a classic symptom. So this kind of pattern right here, so this is why sometimes they feel it's like a chest pain or sometimes they feel like, oh, it feels like something's really squeezing my left chest or pec, pec major. That's part of the referred pain, but sometimes it can spread all the way down to the tips of their fingers or, or down their arm over here. Okay, so this is a um, classic. So this is why I want you to know the other organs. I think it's interesting to know because sometimes like, yeah, you're it's like, oh, my gallbladder is down here. But why am I feeling pain up here in my neck or back? Is like that's referred pain. Internal organs display pain in a funny way. Like you know something's affecting it, but it kind of manifests differently other than its original site. Okay, now let's go to our next top hat question. Oh, a little review. Which coronary artery blockage would be the deadliest? Okay, the response is, it looks like most of you said LAD and most of you are correct. Again, that's the Widowmaker. And I also bring this up because I think I misspoke and I said like it was a coin flip. That's actually an overestimation of like survival. And I actually tried to, I was like, where did I find the original stat for how much people or how often people actually survive a Widowmaker? And I ended up in a rabbit hole and found more studies that are giving different estimations thing is that of all of them, the, yeah, the LAD is the most deadly type of heart attack. Because again, why? It supplies that left ventricle that pumps that oxygenated blood to the rest of your body. And your body needs oxygenated blood. So that's why it's the deadliest type. And let's ask another question. So about heart attack symptoms, so we covered those general symptoms in that previous slide. These symptoms are the same between females and males. 
Yeah, so if you know somebody who survived the Widowmaker, they're very lucky. They got uh, another lease in life. Okay, let's look at the responses. So most of you said false and most of you are correct. So the list is the same, but there is a slight difference in the list. So again, these are the five classic symptoms we showed in the previous slide, but there is a twist to those symptoms. And this is why it often has consequences in terms of detecting a heart attack and treating a heart attack in time. So there are differences and whenever I talk about females and males, I'm just talking about, again, we're talking about the basics here. So I know that, and actually it's kind of funny that whenever someone asks a question about transgender people, it's very interesting because like, I'm finding like there is a lot, there are a lot of people doing research on this stuff. And, I'm, and also I talked to an endocrinologist and they said that trans people are actually pretty willing to help contribute to research and science, which I think is great because again, the more people we have participating in the studies, the better our results. Okay, but in terms of just the basic vanilla, what we have here, we're not talking about like people who transition, but in, when they're looking at this, just males versus females, what they see is that overall males, cisgender males have a higher overall lifetime risk during their lifetime. And that's what we see at the black dots over here. And then with the, the white dots, we see that women have a lower chance of developing an MI during their lifetime. Now, so there's a higher lifetime risk in males. Now, males also develop MIs earlier. So if you take everybody who developed an MI and take their average age, what we see is that average age in males is that they're developed at around 65 years. So you see it's more toward older males, whereas the average age in female people who just develop MIs, it's around 72 years. And so there is like a delayed development in terms of average of developing an MI. And what we see here is the trend, and this is, don't I don't have to expect you to know what this incident rate per 10,000 years, that's like a little epidemiology. But what we see is that, okay, we see that overall we have more occurrences of MIs in men versus women over years. But notice that as we get older, so age is a risk factor in developing an MI. And then all of a sudden women take over here. And this is very interesting, but it's also affected by how many people actually make it to ages of 90 and above. So this is why it's kind of like that. But it also leads to a hypothesis called the timing hypothesis. And I put estrogen because it's not called the estrogen timing hypothesis in all papers, but the timing hypothesis is referring to the presence of estrogen. So this is like, so what we see is that a lot of, there's a lot of research about estrogen and whether it has a role or how, what, how much of a role does it have in cardiovascular disease and heart health. So the estradiol normal range, what we see here is that, ooh, this is a chemical structure of estradiol. I don't expect you to know the exact structure, but it, hmm, think about it. That, this is why I made such a big deal about this back in when we talked about the endocrine system is like, okay, is that peptide, steroid, or monoamine? Hmm, looks like something four rings, so probably a steroid, right? But back to the normal range. So again, what we see is this is the normal estradiol concentration and a premenopausal female, and then the normal and oh, I should say postmenopausal, maybe this is the old slide. So what we see here is that postmenopausal we see a big drop, and then overall we see that at least with premenopausal females, we have a higher normal estradiol concentrations compared to males. So this is what they thought that estrogen is. The timing hypothesis is like maybe estrogen is cardioprotective. In other words, it kind of prevents and helps to prevent things like myocardial infarction. So that's what the timing hypothesis is. But notice that postmenopausal again. This is a mistake here is that this levels of estrogen drop, yeah, they drop dramatically. Now, I don't expect you to norm memorize these normal ranges. This is not necessary for fill one for two, especially since these ranges like differ between hospitals, institutions, and labs, and countries. So don't worry about this for, what I want you to appreciate is like, okay, premenopausal females have a higher estrogen level. So the hypothesis is that estrogen protects the heart. Now, what is menopause? And we'll cover this more when we talk about the female reproductive system later. So you may have heard of some of your more mature relatives or loved ones say, oh, about talk about the change. And what is the change? Well, this is a natural thing that occurs. What happens is that during the female life cycle, then menstrual activity stops, and this is due to changes over time as, the as a woman has fewer and fewer 
ovarian follicles, therefore they have fewer and fewer of the cells that produce estrogens. These are granulosa cells, but again, more to come when we talk about the female reproductive system. So what happens is that once you have a decrease in these cells that produce estrogen, what ha once all these follicles are ruptured and there's no more eggs, then you have this big drop in estrogens. And th what you see here is like this laundry list of things that happen in response to that. So to back to the timing hypothesis, if estrogen is, estrogens are cardioprotective, so does, is that why we see an increased risk of myocardial infarctions in females and why they start to over catch up with males as they get older? So what we see is that estrogens, well, this led to, there are many studies that saw that, okay, HRT is hormone replacement therapy. So some people who are postmenopausal, they take hormones that bring up their estrogen levels and hormonal levels back to how it was before menopause. And what they saw is that people on this treatment had a decreased risk of myocardial infarctions. And there were multiple studies that support this. So what they did is that they actually gave these postmenopausal people, they gave them hormone replacement therapy and saw whether that affected and protected their heart against and myocardial infarctions and what they saw so it was a big big study in this and and this circulation is one of the top journals with cardiovascular health so they did multiple things and they but they had to stop it because during a study they also have to say like okay what's happening to the people who are participating are they having an increased risk of other things or other diseases due to whatever intervention we're giving and they had to stop it because they saw the people who were getting the hormone replacement therapy were actually experiencing increased cardiovascular events. So we're saying like, oh, maybe this isn't quite, so they have to stop a uh, study if they think it might actually be causing more harm. So the current thing is like, okay, the, this is why I say it's the timing hypothesis because what they did is try to do is like saying, okay, let's give estrogen and see if it actually prevents heart attacks. but. What they saw is like it's either not that's not the case or it's not beneficial or it might be actually harmful but again that's what we have here so you might think okay well okay women have a def decreased risk of myocardial infarctions overall they have higher levels of estrogen premenopausal so why are there why are the differences so again men develop mi's earlier on average but this is the interesting paradox. Females die more often of MI, so even though they have a lower chance of getting an MI overall, why are more women dying from MIs? And this is why, so like a higher rate of dying in the hospital. So what we see here is like dying in the hospital from what we call ST elevation myocardial infarction. I don't know if we can cover ST elevations in this class. If you go to med school you'll, and nursing school, you'll definitely need to know. And then we're not just about dying in the hospital, but after you have an MI, you recover and you're living your life after, what's the chance of you dying from the, everything that occurred as a result of the MI? And what we see is that more females than males die five years, like so again, start the clock when this person has an MI, and then look five years later, how many people died in that time? And we see that more females die. And there's also an increased risk of heart failure in females post MI. So it's like, okay, if estrogen is possibly protective and women develop MIs later in life, so why are they dying more often? So it, there are multiple things that can happen. So it's like chest pain and discomfort is common in both. But one interesting thing is that females are more likely to experience things like the shortness in breath. Nausea and vomiting seems to be something that's more common in terms of women experiencing MIs versus men experiencing MI. So this one tends, but again, sometimes when you have symptoms, you're not necessarily gonna get all of them, but to see the, these are the ones we see more frequently in female patients. And back and jaw pain is also something we tend to see more in female patients versus male patients. Now, it's interesting too, like this, oh, I think this was from circulation, I'm like, compared with men, women are less likely to recognize and act upon the symptoms of heart attack. And I'm like, isn't this kind of like, I'm like, not quite. I mean, maybe it's like, okay, if we're associating things like with that overdramatic clutching the chest and numbness and just like falling over and gasping, there's another part of this as well. So what we see in this journal right here, this article, and is that they had a hospital and what they saw is like, okay, in terms of people who have chest pain, they found like similar levels, 
of people who actually had something like myocardial, something like an MI. And, but what they saw is like, even though they had similar, not exactly the same, but this is like, okay, around the teens of people who had chest pain, yeah, they did have something in their heart going on. They saw that more, most of the men were being sent to the cardiologist compared to, yeah, around half the women were being sent to a cardiologist. So it's like, okay, it's not just about someone recognizing their own symptoms, but also health professionals recognizing the symptoms and saying, hey, let's get an EKG just to make sure this is not a heart attack. So yeah, it's like, it's not, we're not seeing the equal numbers over here. So this is something that also might be contributing, not just about how the symptoms are presented and just the physiology, but whether we're actually recognizing the symptoms and giving the appropriate treatments. So yeah, I mean, cause the thing about it is like shortness of breath and chest pain, that's also the symptoms of, that's something that MIs have in common with a panic attack. But which is worse to kind of shrug off? Like, do you think like, okay, panic attacks, they're uncomfortable, but you're going to survive. But come if you have a myocardial infarction and you don't diagnose it and you don't do EKG and this person goes on, you send them off with, here, I'll refer you to a therapist, even though they're actually having myocardial infarction, that's way more deadly. So that's why this is a big problem in healthcare is getting, making sure that people get diagnosed with the right and that we don't have this disparity as well. So yeah, prevalence was similar, but men were 2.5 times more likely to be referred to a heart specialist than women. So that's something else to do. So this is why a lot of times in science that actually this is something that occurred while I was in my postdoc studies is that we are now instead of before, like especially in the cardiovascular medicine, a lot of times they ignored the female population because they thought it was the, high, the timing hypothesis. But luckily, um, was that 2014 they said like okay you can't just ignore just because there's estrogen you can't ignore the female population you actually have to include both populations in terms of you doing a cardiovascular study or not just cardiovascular like all animal studies and all cell lines you have to include both sexes and so you include both male and female data if you're going to use that angle yeah so yeah it's, there are differences and this is why they matter because again even though men have an increased risk of higher myocardial infarctions, why are more women dying? And there's multiple pre reasons why that, that can happen as well. But yeah, that's why it's important to be aware, but also find ways to fix these and address these situations. All right, so myocardial infarct, silent myocardial infarctions, like again, this is going about recognizing these symptoms. Sometimes MIs occur and without noticeable symptoms and the people who experience them, they're like, oh, I feel kind of funny, but eh, maybe I just had like heartburn or something. So there are some people that actually had an MI, a real coronary blockage, they survive it and they don't realize how lucky they are. And then when they go to physical and maybe an EKG is given as part of it, they're like, wait, they're looking at it as like, okay, some of these axes are off. Hey, I think this person had a myocardial infarction a while ago. So sometimes like, and this is further underscoring the point, Myocardial infarction symptoms aren't always very, aren't very dramatic like we saw in that video. So sometimes they can be very subtle. So if someone has like, especially chest pain and shortness of breath, I mean, even shortness of breath is kind of a warning sign to begin with. So definitely seek out urgent care or some sort of medical intervention if you have that chest pain and shortness of breath. Even if it's a panic attack, it's better to be diagnosed with a panic attack and have an EKG that's normal, then have an MI and not get EKG and then try to shrug it off. All right, let's do another top hat question. True or false, the heart can re beat without a brain. All right, let's see the responses. Most of you said true and most of you are correct. Very, you might be like, wait, really? So I'm going to prove it to you. I'm going to show you some evidence now. What we have here, so we here we have a, I think this is actually from a mouse, for, yeah. And what you can see is this heart is beating over here and here's our brain. So can our heart beat without this brain? Now, there's this technique in sometimes using cardiovascular research and physiology. It's called Langendorf perfused heart. I don't expect you to memorize this, but what's happening here is that we have a heart and then it's being given buffers that are pH balanced, they have oxygen, it has dissolved oxygen and glucose in it. 
So that's what's happening here. Do you see a brain? There is no brain here. So what's happening is just supplying oxygen and nutrients to this heart via this buffer and it's able to beat on its own. So yes, the heart can beat without the brain and that is a, a phenomenon we call autorhythmicity. So do all cardiomyocytes contract simultaneously? I did mention that eventually all the heart muscle cells need to beat, but are they just going contracting and relaxing like that? But what we see is that yes, eventually all cardiomyocytes and all the heart muscle cells contract at one point, but what we see is that this cardiomyocytes are contracting in a fat wave-like fashion. So we notice that this part is contracting, then this part is contracting, and then the whole cycle repeats. So that's what we call the cardiac cycle. So that part about the, how the heart's able to beat by itself is due to this car. It's due. To, this is how our cardiac cycle works. It's like our heart's ability to control its own pace and beat without needing intervention from the brain. But that's also what's so cool about the heart. So again, systole and diastole, you have to know these two terms because if you don't understand these two ter terms, you might want to review them and then come back to this lecture because that these are very important terms for the cardiac cycle. Now, cycle meaning that it happens over and over again, and this is happens every time your heart beats. We will get to EKGs later on, probably on Friday, because I don't think we're going to have time today. But... In terms of the cardiac cycle, what we see is that, okay, eventually all the heart muscle cells contract and eventually relax. So when we start off the cardiac cycle, we have atrial contraction that's going to squeeze, increase pressure here in the atria. That helps to fill the ventricles and then the ventricles, they start to contract and then that's going to eject the blood up into the pulmonary trunk and aorta. And then the ventricles relax, and actually this is the big driver of filling. So that's why we have the, even though the atria aren't contracting yet, it's due to the ventricles expanding. That's why we have a drop in pressure that helps to suck the blood from the atria into the ventricles, and then the whole process starts again. So these are the phases of a cardiac cycle. So it starts with the beginning of atrial systole. So again, we're talking, this is why you also need to know the chambers of the heart because if you don't know the chambers of the heart then you don't if you don't know which chamber where they lead to it's going to be really hard to understand the cardiac cycle so notice that atrial and systole and ventricular systole they do not overlap so atrial systole is when the atria squeeze and contract and then we have our ventricular systole so notice that at, the border of atrial systole isn't the or the end of atrial systole is the beginning of ventricular systole and why is that well if you think about it this way if the atria and ventricles are squeezing at the same time the atria want to move the blood into the ventricles but the ventricles if you have this av valve open and the atria are trying to squeeze in here you're going to have the ventricles pushing back so it's not going to be very efficient if atrial systole is overlapping with ventricular systole so, but after atrial systole, we have ventricular systole that moves the blood into the great vessels. And then what we have is atrial diastole because again, why the atria, if it was in systole, would have a hard time pushing against this closed AV valve. So over here, we have ventricular diastole and notice that overlaps with atrial diastole. So now both the atria and ventricles are relaxed. So notice that when the atria relax, they also have a drop in pressure, and that's going to help to bring in blood in from the great vessels over here. And then what we also have is ventricular diastole, which causes a drop in pressure inside the ventricles, and that's going to suck blood in from the atrium into the ventricles. So that's what we call passive filling. And the atria provides an additional squirt once we go back into the, 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 the first phase of the cardiac cycle. So this is what I expect you to know, the atria, how the, the timing of atrial systole and ventricular systole compare to each other and when this occurs during this cardiac cycle. Now, systole again is contraction and this is why it's very important to know, the, know this, this, this relation between volume and pressure because when you have contraction, that decreases the volume just like that squeeze bottle, increasing the pressure and that pressure helps to drive blood into the next chamber or vessel depending on which chamber you're talking about. Now diastole is relaxation. So relaxation, remember that when muscles contract, they shorten. 
just like when they relax, they increase in length. So if you increase in length, that's also going to increase your volume of the chamber, and that's going to decrease pressure. And when you have, and remember that things move from a high lift pressure to low pressure. So this is why it's very important to relax, to also help to move blood into a vessel. So if a vessel enlarges, that's going to draw things into it due to the drop in pressure. Okay, so then this is what I want you to know. So this is definitely, you have to know when the systoles are timed during this cardiac cycle. And that diastole is not just about contraction, but diastole, diastole is also important for allowing time for the chambers to actually fill. Because if it's squeezing all the time, you're not going to have any blood to really pump if you have your heart completely contracted most of the time. You need that di enough diastole time, and that's why we have that long ventricular diastole, because you want to make sure the heart fills enough so that you're able to pump blood to the rest of your body. So the cardiac cycle is talking about that cycle and that sequence of events that occurs when the heart contracts and pumps blood. So I like to draw an analogy between this like a piston system. Like what we hear is like have a, this intake, compression, power, and exhaust. It occurs in a cycle and this is how a piston works in our engines to drive a car. But remember that cars are more than just the machinery. You also need something to set off the ignition and start up your car. So I like to say like the cardiac cycle is how you're able to actually pump things. Like if you have a fuel vehicle, then this is how you're able to actually inject the fuel and do, get rid of the exhaust as well. The conduction system is more of the wiring and this is the part that is able to cause that and that auto rhythmicity we see, saw with that heart earlier. So the conduction system is the wiring, the cardiac cycle is more about the actual physical events that occur. So just like here in the orchestra, what you have is a conductor. And without a conductor, what's going to happen? Well, either the percussion or the first violinist is going to try to like take over the whole rhythm and everything of the, the beat of the orchestra. But what's going to happen is that the conductor helps to organize things, keeps the beats, cues people when which sections come in at what time. Just like the heart conduction system of the heart, the conduction system of the heart is there to cue in the appropriate parts of the heart in time so that you have the cardiac cycle occurring at the right time, at the right pace. So again, your heart isn't going to contract all at once, just like in an orchestra. I mean, maybe if you're doing like some like really chaotic piece, you may have everyone playing their own thing at once. But the conductor is very important in cueing in the right parts in a coordinated fashion so that you have the same things happening at the same, or like, so that you have some sort of coordination between the different parts of the heart, just like you have the conductor coordinating the different parts of an orchestra. Now the conduction system, this involves specialized cardiac muscle cells and fibers, so they are not nerves. So these cells are actually specialized muscle fibers, and you may be like, wait, that's kind of weird, why not nerves? Well remember that the two, or compared to like the four types of tissues, we have epithelial, connective, nervous, and muscle. So the muscle and nervous, these are our excitable cells that can do something called we call action potentials, and we'll get to that on Friday. But what these are, action potentials are, are electrical activity due to the movement of ions across the plasma membrane of a cell. So the interesting thing is that these specialized cardiac muscle cells, instead of actually contracting, their whole purpose is to ferry these electrical signals due to ions across the entire heart. So they're the important conduct conductor. And here's a cool thing too. So what we have here is induced iPS cells induce pluripotent stem cells. <laughs> and yeah, these are cells in a Petri dish, and then you can actually use certain chemicals and certain timing to cause them to differentiate into cardiac cells. So what we have here are stem cells that have been made into cardiac-like cells, and they're beating by themselves. Yeah, there's no brain here, there are no neurons here. So cardiac cells are able, of, are, they have the capability, if they're, especially in the conducting system, to generate their own electrical activity and simulate their own contraction. So that's that why your heart is able to beat without the brain. Yeah, it is kind of fr freaky <laughs> too. It's like, yeah, it is, it's just like, wow, this, like, this thing is like being by itself. All right, so the conducting system of the heart is actually within the walls of the heart, but what we have here is something called the SA node. So it's the sinoatrial node, 
and that's what and we have these internal pathways now I don't expect you to memorize the internal pathways but know that they exist and they're the important connection between the SA node and what we call the atrioventricular node again our atria are up here the ventricles are over here so the AV node sits at that border between the atria and ventricles then we have something called the AV bundle leading from the AV node so the AV bundle carries this along the interventricular septum that helps to divide the left and right ventricles. And oh yeah, sometimes it's also called the bundle of hiss. I think you should know both because it's like this is bundle of hiss is also a very co common and popular name. So I think you should definitely know both the um, one that's named after person. Yes, someone's last name was actually hiss or his. And then the AV bundle is the one without the name. Then there's these bundle branches, so there's the left and right accordingly. And then there's these, okay, Perkin, yeah, I think, what was it? This is, the original pronunciation is Perkinia, but everyone says Perkinji. So these Perkinji fibers, these help to take these signals from the bundle branches and spread it along the walls of the ventricles over here, and also the septum. But yeah, these are also called subendocardial branches, but I think people like, actually it's funny because the Martini book, they try to go to subendocardial branches, but everyone's like, what are those? I know, are they're kind of where the Purkinje fibers are. So they just went back to Purkinje fibers for the newest edition because almost everybody who knows something about the heart, they know about these Purkinje fibers. So what happens is that this conductive system, that's why we're able to have the atria contract because again, we have these electrical signals coming from here. And then notice that these signals spread down here toward the ventricles. So this is why during cardiac cycle, we always have the atria contracting before the ventricles because these electrical signals always pass this way in the normal functioning heart. So they pass from atria to ventricles. So this is why the conducting system is very important. But the interesting thing is that, or this is my one of my favorite mnemonics too. So mnemonic time, so save, so you kind of elongate the A because why it's going S-A-A-V. So save his bunch of perks. So these Purkinje fibers. And again, if you don't the, if you use, do the AV bundle and subendocardial branches, you don't, you can't really use this mnemonic. But again, this is why I think you should, it's worth your time to know both the, the one that's named after somebody and the one that isn't because again, some, especially surgeons, they love the ones that are named after people. So that's why you should know both versions of these structures. All right, so where does the cardiac cycle start? So again, this is why we see this contraction. We see the atria contract, and after the atria contract, we have the ventricles contracting. So it's due to this uh, conduction system, and you can kind of see part of it here, here. You can see the bundle branches, and you can see the Purkinje fibers. So what we, this is why we're able to have this con coordinated conduction and contraction. So it's not all contra contracting all at once. It's in a wave-like fashion because that electrical signal is spreading from the SA node to the AV node, then down here, and then down to the Purkinje fibers. So that's why we have that, that eventually all of the heart muscle cells do contract, but it has to be cued in at the right time, just like that orchestra with the conductor. So how does the heart maintain its rhythm? Well, it's due to something called pacemaker cells. And this is why we saw that, that disembodied heart. I think it's that in the original video, they said it's a rabbit heart. So there's something called pacemaker cells. And these are the ones that initiate those electrical signals that spread along the conduction system. So this is the primary site of the pacemaker cells in the SA node. The AV node does have a secondary population of these pacemaker cells, but these are the ones that if you have both of these, then the SA node ones are the ones that set the beat. These are the ones that set the beat. The others, I mean, if the SA node is damaged, this can take over. And it's actually interesting, like the other parts of the conducting system, if you have something damaging certain parts, they can take over. But the SA node in the normal heart, this is the one that sets that pace and sets that autorhythmicity where the heart can beat without a brain. So that's why these are very important. So now we have to talk about this. And maybe we'll talk more, I'll try to, maybe I'll cover this about mem the basics about membrane potential and we'll talk more about what this is. So if you remember potential, you might be like, oh no, this sounds like action potentials in neurons. And it is related. 
It's different, but it is related. Some of the vocab is the same. So again, action potentials are some sort of cellular electrical activity. And what we have here are sodium, so sodium ions, and then potassium ions. And this is different from a neuron. Now we have calcium ions, but we do see things like threshold, we see depolarization and repolarization. But you might be like, what is that memory potential? Or, oh my god, I totally forgot what that was. So yes, it has to, you have to just talk about this because this is important for the conduction system. So <laughs> membrane potential and this, do not take this to a physics class because I know like some physicist is probably like, this isn't what electrical potential is, it's about the movement around, and like, no, 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 no. This is my very inexact way of explaining like electric charge uh, or just explaining it to somebody who has no knowledge of physics and physiology. It's kind of like electric charge inside a cell. So is the inside of a cell negative or positive? And when I mean negative or positive, it means relative to everything that's surrounding it. But I'd like to think of it as like, okay, is the inside of a cell negative or positive? Again, don't take this to other classes. Don't take this to chemistry. Don't take this to physics. This stays in our class. And this charge is based on whether you have like more positive ions in your, inside your cells or more negative ions and whether the outside is more positive or negative. So it's like, is the inside of your cell relatively negative or is it relatively positive? So with what we have here, very simple example, we're not included. So this is not how it actually looks like inside a cell, but for illustrating the, the, the purposes of membrane potential, what we have here are a bunch of positively charged cations, and what we have is an equal distribution. There are six on both sides. Now, what happens, now they're completely balanced. So we would actually consider the cell in this case, again, the, cy the cytoplasm inside the cell, that's the fluid inside of the cell. Well, we would consider this zero membrane potential because it's even steven with its surroundings. But if we move some of these ions, and now we have, oh, now it's 75, and it's imbalanced. The more of these we start to build up on one side, now we start to have a, a change in membrane potential. So membrane potential is just some difference in the contents of these ions, these charged ions on the outside versus the inside of the cell. So what we see is that compared to the outside, the inside of the cell is less positive than the outside. So as we move more of these and start to make, create this imbalance between the ion concentrations, we're actually changing the membrane potential every time we do this. But the thing about this is like if you start to stack all these positive charges on one side, well, it's due to concentration and also due to the electrical forces. Like if you ever play with magnets, you know it's like, okay, you can put stick magnets one way, but if you try to flip it around 180 and try to put it together, it's going to repel each other. Well, similar thing happens with electrical charges. Similar electrical charges also repel each other so that's what we, it's very hard to actually for cells to maintain this sort of imbalance. Yeah, so this is as you more you stack of one ion on one side, it's due to electrical and concentration that it actually starts to push back the more of the, the same ion you try to stack on one side of a membrane. Now, membrane potential, that's the difference in basically this electrical potential. But again, if you're just starting out, I like to say it's like the difference in the electric charge inside of a cell versus the electric charge outside of a cell. So again, do not use it in other classes. If you have a membrane potential of zero, that's like the beginning of that first that slide we just talked about. It's when you have ion ch ion ch are charges, the the charge the balance of positive and negative charges are equal inside of a cell and the outside of the cell, so that they're relatively like balanced in terms of their positive and negative charge. Now, negative memory potential means that a cell has more negative charge than its surroundings. Again, this is my, my inexact fill one for two, one for one, one for two definition. So what we have here is a bunch of negative charges, and we have some positive charges. But notice that this cell, the cytoplasm, has overall more negative charge than its surrounding. So we would say this cell has a relative negative memory potential. So membrane potential is represented by number. Whether that number is positive or negative depends on if there is more negative or more positive charge inside the cell compared to the outside. So if the cell is re really negative, say we add even more negative ions to this cell compared to its su surrounding, that number will actually get lower and lower. So it might go from like negative 50 to negative 100 
or I don't know if it can go to 200, but the more negative the number, the more it's stacked toward the negative in the inside of a cell. Now for positive membrane potential, what that means is that the cell has more positive charge than its surroundings. So now we have all these positive ions over here and we have some negative ions. But notice that in this case, the cell has much more positive charge compared to its surroundings. So then the number for the mem membrane potential would be, have a positive sign attached to it. So the, the number gets bigger, the more it's stacked toward the positive inside the cell. So to end with today's lecture, I'd like to talk about my favorite analogy. And I know it's like, I, some people don't like this analogy. If you don't like this analogy, don't take it. But this is my analogy to, okay, we have imbalances between the ions in the cell. So the analogy I like to say is like, your cell is like a banana and it's being thrown into the ocean. So the banana is representing your cell. The ocean is representing the fluid surrounding your cells. Now the cells, it's because the banana is representing a cell. What mineral are bananas full of? Or what ion? Yeah, they're full of potassium. I think almost everyone knows this, right? Even so potassium, why do I bring up you choose this fruit? Well, everyone knows like bananas are full of potassium. So in a cell at rest, you have a higher concentration of potassium inside a cell compared to the surrounding fluid. Now, in the extracellular fluid, remember that the ocean is very salty, right? And basic chemistry, what is the chemical formula for table salt? Remember that sodium chloride. And not co this is why I use this analogy, because you have a, at a cell at rest, you have higher concentrations of sodium and you have higher concentrations of chloride outside of the cell than inside of the cell. And sometimes I take this analogy a little further by including seashells. So you have a lot of seashells in the ocean and seashells, especially the part that their, their stru mineral structure is made out of calcium carbonate. So this is why I bring up seashells because there's a lot more calcium in the outside of a cell at rest than a cell on the inside. Now, why do I bring this up? Well, go back to diffusion. If you have higher concentrations of an ion somewhere and lower concentrations elsewhere, it's going to move from higher concentrations to lower concentrations. So it's kind of like pressure. So what we have here is that this with the banana in the ocean analogy and the cell at rest. So this is the starting point. You have higher concentrations of potassium inside a cell than the outside. So if you open up channels that allow potassium through, it's going to flow from the cell to the outside extracellular fluid. And the sodium chloride, higher concentrations of sodium and chloride on the outside of the cell compared to the inside of the cell. So if you open up these ion channels for sodium or if you open up these ion channels for chloride, they're both going to flood into the cell. So if you open up a sodium ion channel, that floods into sodium into the cell. If you open up a chloride channel, chloride will flood into a cell. Now, again, this is why I add the seashells to the analogy because there is a higher concentration of calcium in the ECF compared to a cell at rest. So if you open up calcium channels, calcium is going to flow into a cell. And we're over time, so I'll save more about that's the beginnings of action potentials. I just talked about memory potentials. Now we get to talk more about those action potentials. And if you want a refresher on action potentials, go back to my or you can look at my past archive of cardiac potential lectures as well. But if you're totally new to action potentials, you might want to go to my nervous system lectures where I talk about action potentials. So you know things about what things are like resting membrane potential, threshold, depolarization, repolarization. That language is the same between the, those vocab words are carried over between neural action potentials and cardiac muscle action potentials so it might be worth reviewing before our next lecture all right i know it's like this is the why i think this is one of the reasons why that exam two tends to be a little harder because this is one of the hardest parts of it is like the action potential and the it's like very cell and molecular biology but this is why it's good to talk about now because and I'll explain why it's important later on on Friday, right? Okay, so thanks for hanging in there. Sorry about the tech problems in the beginning and stay healthy and I'll see you on Friday. Thanks to our moderators and see you then.